Hello, my name is Gareth Machin. I am the Artistic Director of Wiltshire Creative, and I'm delighted to be joined today by our Artist of the Week, Fight Director Paul Benzing. Paul, hello. Hello, very good to be with you. Very nice to see you. Um, so today we're going to um, be looking at some of the specific elements of your, of your craft. And obviously you, you've worked with us on a whole range of different productions, different genres. And I was just wondering, what are the, the sort of things that you take into consideration when you're approaching a particular project? Well, there are probably two really important things. The, the first one is when it's set historically. Is it contemporary or is it set in medieval times or is it earlier? Uh, and then the other one is where on the scale of realism it is is it ultra realistic at one end or or is it highly stylized at the other um, and both of those things come together in a particular production so typically uh, there's any number of Shakespeare productions which are modern dress they've got firearms but then there are also some that are set in a kind of um, never world there there's no no specific time so people have got knives they've got guns they've got swords and th those are really the two important things about uh, really any production whether it's something like shakespeare uh, a, a drama or or indeed a pantomime indeed and the last production that we worked on together was indeed a pantomime with Robin Hood uh, this year. And we thought that would be quite a, an interesting piece to look at in, in terms of some of the techniques that, that, that you use. Um, what, thinking specifically about pantomime, what are, the, what are the kind of things you think about in relation to those, those questions you've just asked? Uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at Robin Hood. And so I, I don't think I've ever done a production of Robin Hood that isn't set in the time of Robin Hood, you know, there's not, you know, a, a sort of an updated version of Robin Hood. So we know that there are going to be what we call broadswords, those kind of wide swords that they use for chopping away at each other. We know there are going to be bows and arrows in it, um, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, and because it's a panto, that also gives us a, a clue to where it's going to be on the sort of realism scale. Um, we, we know there's not going to be blood, it's hopefully not going to be realistic to the, to the point of actually offending members of the audience. Um, and I think that that's, uh, the, the other thing about Panto, I suppose that there's a lot of inclusion of found objects. So something that is to hand um, gets used, whether it's a mop or a broom, typically in a Panto kind of scenario. Um, but I suppose that, well, the other thing actually on Panto is uh, dealing with the realism there's no attempt when people punch or kick each other to make it sound realistic as well. Usually the, uh, the sound effects are provided by the band or perhaps some track or something over, over, over the top of what's going on. So there's no attempt to make a punch look realistic or sound realistic. So that's sort of where we are on our panto. Yes, and... Uh... I, I'm thinking of our brilliant percussionist James in the in the pit hitting all kinds of uh, strange and wonderful percussive instruments to create the the soundtrack for some of the fights. Oh, sorry, Alan. It's one of the great the great joys of that of that show. Um, we, we've got a scene from the pantomime that we're going to, to have a little look at uh, that we recorded from one of the, the performances purely for archive purposes. So, so the quality of the recording isn't brilliant. But of course, looking at a fight on screen, particularly one that wasn't designed to be filmed, is, is very different from sitting in the theatre and watching it. Um, I don't know what your, your views on that are. It's a very good point because I'm... I myself, when I'm, I'm working and watching a fight, often have a, a camera running to record what I'm watching, uh, mostly for the sort of small detail. Um, because I, I guess it's a, it's, it's a different experience being in a theatre, watching something live and watching then something in the mechanical media, either films or television, which take that one moment and fix it forever. 
Uh, whereas in a in a theatre, you, you can come back and see a fight the next day, and it inevitably will be slightly different. It, it can't help but be different. Uh, and and so the I know what we're going to be looking at today is one version filmed on one day, um, and so it, that also includes the um, any inaccuracies that might might occur in in something like that, which again is in the nature of live performing. Great. So, so, so we'll have a little look at the scene, but um, just before we do, I thought if I just explain what's happening in the, in the story, uh, it's all very complicated and convoluted, of course, as pantomimes often are, um, but Robin Hood is, is living in the, uh, in the forest with his, his band of, of merry men, and Maid Marian is living in the castle with the uh, evil sheriff of Nottingham, and Robin has invited Marion into the forest, but Marion knows that she should probably be cautious. So she goes into the forest in disguise. So in the scene, she's in a big cloak uh, and a, uh, with, with a beard. But there is another member of Robin Hood's gang who is also in disguise, who is Alan Adale. Uh, now, Alan Adale is actually Ellen Adale, I hope everyone's still with me, uh, Ellen Adale, who is Maid Marian's long lost sister. And she is also disguised as a man. So we have these two women meeting in the forest disguised as men, um, and both are extremely suspicious of the other. So that's where we are as the, as the scene begins. So let's just have a little look at the, at the scene and um, playing it in, in real time. It's me, Marion! I didn't want anyone to know I was out here, hence the disguise. I'm determined to find my sister, or at least find out what's happened to her. What are you doing in Sherwood Forest, stranger? <clears throat> uh, there's uh, no rule to say a girl, uh, man, can't walk through the forest. I can enter if I please. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I might have something to say about that. I might have something to say about it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? What are you doing in Sherwood yeah. Forest? You... Oh, shit. <laughs> On hand, that man. Oh, another one. Hold on, then. Hey. Robin! <clears throat> I'll fetch help. <clears throat> Robin! Uh, Robin of Loxley! How do you know that? We met when we were little. <coughs> I don't remember meeting you, sir, but I'm he or was I am So there's a, quite a lot going on in that scene, Paul. It's quite a short um, moment on stage, but there's several sections to, to what's happening physically. So maybe maybe if we if we break it down and look at the the first little section first and, and talk through some of the, the things that are happening on stage there. Yeah, so in terms of the fight content i'm not we're not looking at the sort of acting content the fight content they we decided that it should start quite aggressively with a punch and uh, in this particular setup they they end up um up sideways on to us the audience so that sort of limits what we can do so, but what they're very nicely doing is getting set up uh, sideways to us with the correct distance coming in and the punch goes in there. Now, uh, as we said a little earlier, it's not supposed to be realistic. So it doesn't have to, oh, and isn't even close to one. You can see there's some air between them, but it tells the story of actually being hit in the face and falling to the ground which then leads on to the next section, which is where he <laughs> jumps on him and tries to strangle him like that. So, of course, one of the, one of the issues we had is that the, the actors at the start of the scene were on the wrong side of the stage because I think Lauren, who throws the punch, was, was right-handed and we wanted the punch to be going upstage. So we had to, to block in a, a circle around each other that... I think we used to just, just build the tension at, the, at that moment and, and helped us to get the actors in the right position. Yeah, and that's, that's something that frequently happens where um, performers ha end up 
on stage on a particular side of the stage for a reason even if maybe just a quick change has meant that they can only come on on one side but when they're executing a bit of technique um, if, if they're right-handed sometimes it has to be done the other way around and so there's got to be some way of um, moving them around now it could be that they came together had a little grapple and in that they turned to get to the right side in this particular case there was some dialogue so we use that to, to cover them sort of circling each other to get into the correct position and, and I think it's always interesting when when I watch you work Paul that there, there often has to be a um, a little bit of shuffling around to get ourselves into the right position but then there's always a moment before whatever the physical action is going to be where the actors reconnect and and focus and and you you talk a lot about the importance of eye contact at that critical moment yeah uh, and and again that's a that, that's a very important part of uh, of what what i do and what the performers have to do um so there's always a point i i try and emphasize when they are they're not acting they're fighting and, and it's just that the, the shuffling around and all that is all, is all can be very naturalistic that gets them into the position but once they're in the position they're executing the technique that we've been talking about not not something vaguely like that the correct technique um not only for their own safety but also hopefully um for telling the story to the audience yeah and i think that's really interesting what you say about the the moment where where you have to stop acting as well because perhaps less so in a pantomime but perhaps in a more realistic drama where clearly if a moment of violence is going to happen emotions are presumably running high and so it's really important that at the moment before the physical action happens there's a moment of control in order to make the th that physicality safe in the way that you describe yeah absolutely and I always say to actors, and it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, when you're executing fight technique, you should try and do it cold, so that you're you're not thinking about the reasons why someone's killed your parents. You're actually, I'm am I in the right position on stage? Am I at the right angle on stage? Am I at the right angle next to my partner? Am I at the right distance away? Um, uh, and, and what was it that bloke said about making sure that my hands higher up on a punch and it's not sort of down out of sight um, so that so that those are the kind of things they should be thinking about rather than the reality of whatever situation they're in in, in a in a serious drama and then of course whoever's being punched, and in this instance uh it's it's marion who who then has to fall to the floor and so presumably falling is also part of your remit as well to make sure that people are are safe because that that fight is being performed twice a day six days a week so somebody could easily get hurt if they're not falling properly yeah that, that that's very that's very true and, and i'm and i'm wondering if you if you could count them up there are probably more people get hurt just falling over rather than using swords or daggers or anything like that because it, it, can, it can often just go oh yeah you just fall over and that's fine apart from the one occasion when it's not and you hurt your knee or your elbow or your hand and as you say you've got to do it twice tomorrow and twice the next day that can be a, a big problem uh, but fortunately though you could see the costumes they were wearing there was ample room for knee pads uh, and elbow pads so uh, with that and with me showing them a reasonable technique about how to fall over uh, in the case of the punch uh, as they're being turned and falling to the their right their hands are coming up and if they think of continuing that journey down and laying their hands on the floor that takes them in a sort of arc all the way down onto the ground um, and it it's a really very simple thing to do and can be very controlled great now before we move on to the um, the next section we have a, a special treat i believe because you're going to uh show us a little bit more specifically how to to punch on stage accurately not that we are for one moment suggesting that people should try this in their own homes this is purely a, a demonstration of your of your craft and you you've got some a member of your your household to um to assist you uh yeah absolutely right 
So what we're going to do is have a, a slightly more detailed look at that uh, first move, which is a punch to the face. Um, I have my beautiful assistant, Alice here, uh, who's going to be helping me. So this is the, uh, the punch to the face. And we've seen in the clip that they end up uh, di directly opposite each other at right angles to you, the audience. Now that means that we can't use any of these punches that come across here because clearly there's a big gap between the end of my fist and the front of the face there. So we can't do anything going this way. Um, and what we ended up using is this punch, a straight punch that comes from over my right shoulder to over my partner's right shoulder. So it's a straight line, but it's actually going diagonally between us. You probably can't see the angle, but that's the whole point of it. It's coming across here. So the most important bit of this is the safety, and that is the distance between us. Obviously, this is too close. This is too far away. And uh, the way we use for measuring the distance between us to keep it um, safe, but also to keep it looking vaguely realistic, is to use the left hand. My left hand goes on my partner's right shoulder. And I take half a pace back from that. Not, not like this, yeah, and not too close. So it's stepping back so that my arm is straight. That gives me the correct distance. What I then do is stand, still staying directly in front of her, which gives us the correct angle. I prepare with my fist out to the side so that my partner can see what's coming and you, the audience, can see what's coming. I then throw the punch so that it's coming in a straight line, passing the line of the front of her face. At that point, it starts to move and my hand drops down. What we usually say is that you're trying to hit a parrot that's sitting on your partner's shoulder. Um, now, obviously, if you're doing this in a production, you can't really walk up to someone and measure the distance like that. But it, it doesn't take very much practice to, to know what the distance is. Uh, but for the purposes of this thing, I will always use my hand to make sure that you are aware that that is the distance between us. So it's hand on shoulder half a step back as I'm preparing and I'm throwing the punch and there is a reaction. So what we get is an action and a reaction. Now the only other thing to add on that is that whilst I'm doing that on stage, I am always looking at the person I'm fighting. Yeah. So whatever the di discussion would be, I would come up to them, still looking at them, I prepare, I hit. And that is the way of doing straight punch. There we go. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. So let's uh, let's have a look at the next section of the fight and see see how it develops there. So the first thing that seems to happen is that uh, Alan Adale goes on top of Marion and has to. Um, throttle her at that point. That's the that's the physical action. So so she's trying to to get her hands around around Marion's neck. So how how do we do that safely? Well, uh, this is one I can show you right now. Um, so the the basic um, idea is that uh, someone's lying on the ground in front of you, and as you approach them, if you get your hands into that kind of formation, and then you then place the um, your partner's windpipe in that V there. So the hands would go around, vaguely around the neck, uh, round about in line with your collarbone, which you could feel underneath your hands. Uh, they arrive there. I would then grab those hands. And what happens is that I would push in and the person trying to strangle me pulls out, which actually creates a, a sort of tension there. Uh, and a, and a very secure grip is held there so that when they actually roll into the next move um, if I'm being strangled I've got a hold of the hand and all I do is I'm falling backwards and I'm literally pulling my partner with me into that kneeling position so that she comes up into the uh, a kind of kneeling position which places her in the correct position for when Robin then comes off to grab her and uh, heave her off the, the strangling move. So the person who is who is being 
throttled is always in control of the amount of pressure that is being put on them. Yeah, so that they've got a hold of the, the strangler's hands and they're pushing them in or out um, so that uh, there is no, the, the person strangling has got to learn that having made that initial contact like that, it, it stays like that. You don't, you don't sort of try and come up or to the side. Anything like that is going to be painful. All they have to do is that and then get that sense of pulling outwards as the strangler is having their hand pull inwards. And, and is this a technique that is used in, in other situations? I'm thinking about, for example, if somebody has to be pulled by the hair, is, is, is that a similar, um, a similar process? It's exactly the same thing. There's the old, uh, the, the, the very old fashioned hair pull, which if I had hair, I could demonstrate. But so that someone would grab the hair from uh, above and I would then put my hand on top of theirs uh, and I push down while they're pulling up against my hand, which creates a, a sense of tension in, in the arm. Uh, and from there, I can be pulled anywhere that uh, we, we, need, <laughs> we need to take them. And those, both of those techniques not only work standing up, but as we've seen, lying down. So if one person's lying down on the ground you're, and you kneel down to them, it's effectively it's the same, exactly the same process as if you were standing in front of each other. And the same with the hair pull. Again, not something to, to try at home, but, uh, but, but really... Yeah, all, to... all of these uh, techniques uh, are individually, they're, they're very simple but it is very easy for them to go wrong. Someone just accidentally getting smacked in the face and there's uh, no need for any of that. Great, so, so then we get into the final phase of our, of our fight scene. So let's see what, what happens then. So Marion now has Alan on the floor. She's pulled back by Robin who gets his bow out. It's interesting here, Paul, what you were saying earlier on about the um, using the the objects that you'd find but perhaps in unexpected ways so of course robin has a bow here but it's not going to be used in in a conventional way he might go to use it but then it gets used as a weapon in a in, in an unexpected manner yeah uh, and and this is a really good example he, he he goes round he's always got a bow and arrow with him i think in the pretty much every scene in the panto he's got that with him um and it gets turned against him in this uh, particular little scenario. And I think what's particularly, what, what's deceptively um, simple about this is it's all about where the hands end up, isn't it? That, that's what makes it work or not. And I know it's what the actors had to practice over and over again. So very quickly, they could get the right hands into the right position in order for the, the twisting to happen. That's correct. Once Robin's uh, pulled him up and he's got the bow in his uh, right hand, the, the obvious thing would be to just reach and grab the bow. But if you're then going to carry on and do the twisting move, which then disarms the bow and then goes into a, a hitting move into the stomach, if the hands aren't in the right place, it makes it not only awkward, extremely awkward to do, but it all, often means that the, um, the end of the bow, which is the the, de the dangerous bit can actually end up going almost anywhere. Uh, you know, yeah. It could be very easy to smack someone in the face, which is not what we're looking at here at all. Um, it should look like he's been hit in the stomach and then hit in the face uh, safely. <laughs> and again, we, we can see that there's, you know, there's a huge amount of, of distance between where the bow is and where the body is. Um, but but I suppose what that does is it draws attention to how important the reaction is from the person who's being hit in order to tell the story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in all of these cases, you have an action. In this case, the bow is driven into his stomach and a reaction. And then it's apparently driven into his face and there's a reaction to that. And it's the same with a the punch. There is a, a preparation with the action to throw the punch. And then there's the reaction to that. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that's where the acting comes in, on top of the technique. And I suppose also, just going back to what, what we were talking about earlier, the, um, the genre of pantomime allows for that degree of um, illusion in a, in a way that a, a more realistic drama 
you, you wouldn't possibly uh, allow an audience to see that much space between a weapon and the, the body. Yeah, yeah, if you were doing that, then it, it would need um, probably a, a lot longer to rehearse it to make sure that they were completely au fait with what they were doing. Um, yeah, which is the which is the important bit there. If if you're going to do something and, and it's going to look realistic, even if it's just a single punch, it, it does need a proper understanding of the technique and then proper execution of that technique. And it's on occasions like that where we often have, and I think we did in, in this case, you have a, a fight captain, which is someone who's not in the fights, but who can sit outside and watch them and actually say, that that bit doesn't work because you're too close or too far away or or indeed the fight's going too fast which is um, a big problem especially if you're doing it frequently every time you do it it just gets a little bit faster um, and fast doesn't make it better it makes it more dangerous so uh, speed is a a real problem and and i think that's a really really important point as well is that before every performance where there is a a fight the actors will work through it as part of their part of their warm-up so that it's fresh in their minds and the fight captain in the way that you describe can be keeping an eye on it and making sure that it's it's still safe that it's still at the right speed absolutely the, the at, at the fight call as it's called before the first show of the day they get an opportunity to go through it uh, and talk to each other um because obviously when you're doing this you can't say, sorry, that was a bit close, <laughs> could we do it again? But in a fight call, you can actually say, when you did that last night, that was quite close to my face or my stomach. So look out for that. And then the, the fight captain uh, who's watching it can remain objective because when you're doing it at speed and in a performance, it's very difficult for an actor to remain objective um, about the, the, the fight content. And of course, the thing about a fight content, um, is if it goes wrong, then somebody will get hurt, which is why you do need an, an objective eye to keep an eye on what's going on. Now, I think you're going to um, offer up another little demonstration here of um, some of the techniques used in this, this final section. Right, so in this section, we're going to look at uh, uh, disarming the bow. This bit of cane will represent the bow um, from the, the, the original clip, um, and then hitting Robin uh, in the stomach and in the face. Now we know there's been a swing around and when we worked out that to grasp this so that it not only looks realistic in terms of the grasp, but thinking ahead, it's got to also be able to disarm and hit him. So what, we, what we're doing with this grasp is grabbing the, the bow like this so that we can turn this which in theory would cause you to release the bow there. I then prepare back with a hit, which comes into the stomach there. I drop the end of the bow down, which then comes up in front of the face. So the, the whole thing at a slow speed would be grab, disarm, pull away, stomach, face like that and it's aided of course in the um in the in the performance by having the sound effects so as i'm turning this there's a going on there's the disarm the hit has a uh, i think it's a drum beat there and then the same thing with cymbals hitting in the face so that we we know we've got a safe distance between us two arms length we know we can disarm this quite easily let go this comes away from here and it's the same idea with this hit to the stomach as it is with the punch to the face the point of the um the bow comes past his stomach drops down and then hits up across the line of the face right just to be clear what we're looking at here there is no advantage in trying to get very close to your opponent uh, because you will hit them. <laughs> so let me give you an example about the distance between us when, when using 
this stick which represents the arrow. So what we've got here is the disarm, which is very simple and straightforward. That comes out of the hand and I can prepare out to the side. And this end of the uh, bow only needs to come out to here. There's no advantage in it being here, which is very dangerously close. But out to the side here. Similarly, the hit to the face comes up and you're a good six inches away from your opponent. There's no advantage in being close up to your opponent. They are definitely going to get injured otherwise. And then we would return to this position, which is the start of the whole routine. Bang, bang, like that. As a Thank you, Paul. Um, so I suppose one of the other elements um, in this, this jigsaw puzzle is that, of course, with a big show like, like Pantomime that's running for a long time, um, people do get ill. And so we have understudies. And it's really important that they are, are properly um, trained in the, in the fight sequences as well. And so to make sure that the fights are as realistic as we want them to be, but also that everyone is safe on stage. Yes, that, that, that's right. Uh, shows that are long running uh, often have um, a big casts, have lots of understudies. And the understudy uh, has to be able to do the fight the way the principal did it. Uh, and that's another part of my job is having arranged a fight with the, the principals to then get the understudies in to go through the fight so that they could at any time step in and do that fight safely. Um, and usually it's, uh, it's, it's a very straightforward process. Um, we know what the moves are. Sometimes they have to be different because there is a height difference, which can be a, a problem when doing unarmed combat, especially people are throwing punches. If you've got a very tall person, they need to be able to rejig the distances between them. But as long as we know that and we account for that, that's not a problem. Um, and then it's a question of making sure that they get um, rehearsal time so that they can actually uh, safely and confidently be dropped in at any time to, to do the, the fight. And then, in fact, I think the sequence you've got, there are three versions, I think, of it. And I think if you watch the three versions, you will recognize they are exactly the same fight, but they're also a little bit different. If you look at the technique, the technique remains almost exactly the same. The punches, the fall to the ground, the rolling, rolling around, the disarm and the hit with the, um, the bow are all the same. Um, but they are also slightly, slightly different. And as long as the technique remains the same, the, the distances are right, the angles are right for the audience. Um, it, it's to, to an audience going in, it, it's you know, the same fight, which is really important. I may show something to say about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Brilliant. So as you say, Paul, um, essentially the same scene, but just with a, a, a few differences. Um, I know it's particularly sometimes people fall in slightly different ways, um, presumably in a way that they feel they feel comfortable. Yeah, uh, uh, falling is, is a good example of uh, teaching somebody a, a technique about how, how they're going to fall over. And then they, they make it their own. Um, if you're doing a play, and I've done a number of them, where a lot of people fall over, it would look a bit odd if everybody fell over in exactly the same way. That would be very strange. Um, so they they can obviously take that technique and adapt it either um, to, to something that they that they understand well, or that they they could completely change it and say, well, I I want to do I want to fall on the ground and go into a backward roll, so that it's much more 
be a much more dynamic kind of thing. And all of that's a part of the part of the job. Brilliant. Well, Paul, thank you so much for um, giving us such a fascinating insight into your into your craft. Um, and it's a it's a real joy to see you. Well, it's fantastic to um, in these strange times to be able to um, to impart some information. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.